Hello, welcome. Thank you everybody for joining us today. My name is Kari Biggerstall and I'm with the Nature Conservancy and we are here to launch version two of the Nature-Based Solution Benefits Explorer. Uh, the, Na the Nature Conservancy is one of the project partners for this project alongside the CEO Water Mandate, the Pacific Institute, Limnotech, and Dankstat within partnership with the Coca-Cola Company. The NPS Benefits Explorer is a key starting point for organizations looking to invest in nature-based solutions. And today we're gonna to be sharing with you the exciting new features of version two of this tool. So let me share with you what we'll be doing together today. Well, after I've completed this welcome and introductions of a couple of minutes, we'll be hearing from Madhu Rajesh from the Coca-Cola Company on a corporate perspective of nature-based solutions. And then you'll hear an overview of the initiative, where we've come from, where we're going, and how this tool fits into that larger initiative on nature-based solutions benefit accounting. Then you'll hear a presentation on the tool itself, on the benefits, NBS Benefits Explorer version two. And we'll close with some next steps in closing. And you'll have an opportunity to answer questions, ask questions along the way. I am honored to be able to introduce our esteemed panel today. Again, my name is Kari Biggerstall, and I'm the Director of Water Security Science and Innovation at the Nature Conservancy. Also with us today, we have Madhu Rajesh from the Coca-Cola Company. She is the Vice President for Water and Agriculture globally. We also have Greg Brill, who is a Senior Researcher and Technical Lead at the Pacific Institute and CEO of Water Mandate. We also have Ivan Papeldiev, who is the Service Lead for Nature and Biodiversity at Denkstat. And also with us today is Todd Player, who is a Digital Technology Program Manager at the Pacific Institute and CEO of Water Mandate. Before I hand off to Madhu, just wanted to go over a couple of housekeeping items. We really encourage you to ask questions. We wanna know what you're interested in and we wanna be able to address any inquiries that you have about the tool or the project. So please use the Q&A function to ask your questions. You can direct a question to an individual or to the team as a whole. And we'll do our best to answer as many questions as possible during this session today. We are recording this session and we will send out this recording to everyone who registered, those of you here today and those that, that couldn't make it today. And this recording will live on, on our project webpage under the stage two resources page. So without further ado, I'm gonna hand off to Madhu to provide a corporate perspective on nature-based solutions. Thank you so much, Kari, and thank you everyone for organizing. It's a, it's a great, great pleasure to be here with all of you today and to talk about this project that we've been working on now for a couple of years. Um, so water is a key priority for the Coca-Cola company. It is our first ingredient in our beverages. And so uh, the company has had a very long history on uh, working on water stewardship going back uh, to nearly two decades. Um, and working together with its franchise bottling partners, uh, their foundations, as well as the Coca-Cola Foundation. Um, there's been support for a number of projects that contribute to our uh, goal to replenish all the water uh, that goes in our finished beverages. Um, and through this process, there have been a number of learnings. Um, and one key one has been around um, the benefits that we see from nature itself. We've learned that very often, Nature itself has the, uh, mo the most and strongest mechanisms for restoring ecosystems, um, floodplains, and um, has an impact on biodiversity and other co-benefits, which often get missed because the focus is on the number of liters of water, the volumetric benefits uh, of the project. So um, we have been working with Tankstat now going back several years to develop a methodology to um, quantify some of these core benefits of nature-based solutions and their um, and, and related projects. And uh, we've applied this methodology to a number of projects across, um, across the portfolio that we have to see what learnings we can glean from, uh, from it. And this work um, has been done in uh, collaboration with several partners. We're also looking at natural capital valuation at the time but also with CEO Water Mandate, who um, started all their work almost in parallel to when we were working with Dengstad. So it just made sense to join forces and 
uh, make the methodology available as an open source resource and part of the tool um, so that it's available for anyone working on these projects. Because what we learned was that looking at the holistic impacts of um, nature-based solutions help design better, more integrated projects that have broader benefits and help strengthen the business case for nature-based um, solutions as well. So uh, that was the intention. And you'll hear more from colleagues who've been working on this. But um, before, um, before I um, hand over to colleagues, I just wanted to share a couple of case studies on uh, just the kind of benefits we've seen. And one that comes to mind is a program that uh, was implemented in Philippines, which was a water replenishment project looking at reforestation in um, in an area called the Ipo watershed in, uh, in, in Philippines, which supplies water to the city of Manila, which is the second most populous region in that country. And what we what we know about the local context is that in this particular watershed, the forest cover had been um, had dropped quite significantly uh, from about eighty five percent to about forty percent because of a number of reasons such as illegal logging and uh, unsustainable forest practices, um, and that was impacting the water storage capacity in the basin. So. Um, that was a key issue, but there were other so secondary issues such as malnutrition, uh, which was a uh, which was a challenge that the local communities were facing for different reasons. So in, since 2016, the Coca Cola Foundation, working with the Coca Cola Foundation Philippines, um, together with WWF Philippines, uh, also looked at uh, supporting this project that was aimed to protect local rainforests in the area. Uh, replant trees and also look at supporting local communities with livelihoods opportunities. So through the project, um, several hectares of land, I think about 60, 65 hectares of land were um, of degraded land was uh, um, replanted, trees were replanted in that area. Um, and um, <clears throat> the local communities were supported to set up household gardens that helped with them with growing fo uh, food. And uh, the initial focus was on quantifying the replenishment, the volumetric benefits of the project, uh, and, and that was estimated to be about 400 million liters of water per year. But when we piloted the NBS methodology for the project, we also learned that because of the tree cover that had been restored um, in the area, uh, the, the, there were carbon dioxide sequestration benefits from the, from the project, which were quite significant. But also there was an increase in food supply because of household gardens that helped the local co communities address the food insecurity in the region. So there are several examples um, of these projects that we've seen come in. It's not a stand standalone example. I think the methodology has been piloted across several, a couple of dozen projects. Um, and what we found is that the benefits are consistent um, in regardless of country or, or, uh, or, or geography. So it is something very valuable and we'd like to see it um, adopted or used by as many companies that are looking as, um, uh, at nature-based solutions to design and implement better projects, but also a range of stakeholders from the NGO world and civil society to uh, really adopt and mainstream nature-based solutions as much as possible. So um, thank you for having me here and great to be sharing our, exper uh, our experiences and working with all of you on this, on this project. Wonderful, thank you, Madhu. Hi everyone, I'm Greg Brill. I'm a senior researcher with the Pacific Institute where I lead our work on nature-based solutions and also the technical lead for the CO Water Mandate. Um, I'm also the project lead for the Benefit Accounting of Nature-Based Solutions project, um, of which I will give you an overview of the project right now. So the project started in late 2019, and for the last four years, we've been helping build the business case for investments in nature-based solutions globally. As Madhu's mentioned, uh, we've been working with a number of corporate partners, NGO partners, public sector partners to really help identify, account for and value the benefits that accrue from nature-based solutions projects or could potentially accrue from nature-based solutions projects during the pre-feasibility and design stages. 
So to date, we have developed a standardized method, a guide, and a tool uh, to help account for the stacked water, carbon, biodiversity, and socioeconomic benefits from nature-based solution investment globally. We have had five key outputs to date. The first was a landscape assessment, which really set the scene for where the gaps and opportunities lie within the nature-based solution space. We then developed a method as an outcome from this landscape assessment, which helps standardize the approach to benefit accounting. How do organizations identify, quantify, and value uh, appropriate benefits that could accrue from nature-based solutions investments? We've recently launched our second version of our Nature-Based Solutions Guide, which is a very practical implementation tool that helps organizations understand the benefits of nature-based solutions, how and where to invest, uh, and other key practical and pragmatic approaches. One of the key outputs from our, our first stage of work was that stakeholders are not being properly engaged across the different project pipelines and the stage of the nature-based solutions project. So in consultation with a number of external project partners, we put out an NBS stakeholder engagement guide, uh, which helps identify the who, the what, the when, the why um, to engaging stakeholders effectively across a nature-based solutions investment or project. So we really encourage you to take a look at these two very practical guidance documents, one on the real sort of nitty gritty of implementation and one on why and where to engage stakeholders more effectively. And the crown jewel, and our outputs and what we'll be launching today is the version two of the NBS Benefits Explorer, which is our tool that again, helps organizations identify, account for, and value the benefits of nature-based solutions. Our primary audience has predominantly been private sector decision makers, again, because of the focus of the CO Water Mandate, the Pacific Institute, and all of the project partners, we're very much invested within uh, the private sector and private sector decision makers. We have, however, cast it a little bit wider, uh, and we've now been engaging the public sector, a number of different NGOs, civil society groups, investment organizations, all the way through to local communities and indigenous peoples across different geographies. So we're really excited to see that this has global applicability as well as sector applicability as well. We have two specific project pages. The first, as mentioned earlier, www.cowatermandate.org forward slash NBS. You will find all of these key resources, a number of webinars that we've been promoting this work and a variety of different resources that are available uh, to you free of charge. So we really encourage you to, to engage with the work uh, through that project page. And then the NBS Benefits Explorer, which lives at nbsbenefitsexplorer.net. And we again encourage you to explore the tool uh, through this webinar and then beyond as well. As I've mentioned up front, we've had two, two stages of work. And in the first stage, we really focused on benefit identification and benefit accounting. So how do organizations, whether in the corporate sector or outside of that, go about identifying the kinds of benefits, co-benefits, stacked benefits that can accrue from nature-based solutions globally? And then how do you go out and measure or quantify or estimate the benefits that could accrue from these investments? In stage two, we went beyond this and we said, um, how do we go about diving deeper into the benefits through forecasting? When and where do these benefits accrue over different spatial and temporal scales? And what is the potential value of such investments? And this is where stage two is culminating uh, with the launch of the tool today and fulfills the full NBS journey from benefit identification into accounting, into valuation, and, and hopefully this becomes a very practical tool uh, to help folks build the business case for nature-based solutions. So as some objectives and why we undertook this forecasting and valuation work was really to provide greater clarity on benefit accrual and the values that can, that can uh, be yielded through these benefits, uh, NBS benefit uh, investments. We'd like to improve on current forecasting and valuation pre-feasibility efforts to date. Um, and there have been a number of organizations that have dipped their toes into both the, into both the forecasting and valuation work um, globally. And then ultimately, our main aim, support the business case for nature-based solutions investments. We want to see NBS go from novel to the norm. And this is really where our, we've positioned our tool and this project more broadly as well. And we, we hope that we see greater upscaling and mainstreaming of nature-based solutions investments globally. So the use case, we really hope that what we produce will help investors and practitioners really visualize, identify, and understand these benefits across multiple habitats, interventions, and scales more broadly. So we're not going to get too much into the technical weeds here, but from a forecasting perspective, we've done a huge amount of back-end work that goes into it. And again, the forecasts 
provide a spatial and temporal scale of when benefits accrue. So what we've done is we've linked all of our activity categories with our benefit categories across different spatial and temporal scales. And so what we've done is made sure that we have linked as much as possible with this uh, prioritization ranking scale that we've got. We've then linked that through to some academic and gray literature studies as much as possible. But we're looking at around 50,000 manual data points. So again, a huge amount of effort has gone into making sure that these forecasts um, are as robust and rigorous as possible and academically defensible. So a huge amount of work has gone uh, into the back end. This is what the front end potentially looks like, where we have these forecasts, these S curves, showing what your potential benefit accrual could be from a trade off, where, the, where, where you'd see a negative return on investment over a certain amount of time, all the way through to sort of the maximum yield, where you could get the highest potential return on investment. We've got three spatial scales one to four years, five to nine years, and 10 years plus. So you can start understanding when you could really uh, start and, um, accruing the maximum benefits and when your reporting function should report on these maximum benefit accruals as well. You'll see three graphs. The first is the property scale. What happens at the site level where you are investing in your NBS? What's happening is these benefits flow outwards into the city or municipal scale. And then what happens at a much broader scale at that watershed scale? And you'll see that the benefit accrual will start reducing the broader the scales are because obviously the most impact will be felt at the localized level. But again, some really exciting opportunities to forecast when your benefits could accrue, because not all benefits accrue from day one. Some of them do take a longer time period. For example, carbon sequestration or biodiversity. You can see quite a long trajectory there, rather than something like your volumetric supply, which might be a shorter time period. At this point, I'll hand over to Ivan, who will talk about some of the valuation pieces that um, inform the, the tool. Ivan, over to you. Thank you, Greg. Hello, everyone. Okay, what we have here is a summary of the valuation component behind the NBS Benefit Explorer tool. What I won't go into today is the nitty gritty behind every single methodology, because you can read all of that on the tool website. What I will say is and what we have as a process here for complete, completing, completing this work is the natural capital protocol, which tells us first we need to identify some material benefits that occur often when we have nature-based solutions. Then we need to quantify what is the actual physical change in the environment that occurs due to restoring nature. This can be amount of hectares we restore, amount of carbon that gets taken up from the atmosphere, it could be amount of water that gets returned to nature, etc. All of this for you is baked into the tool as some uh, general assumptions, which we can then take and we can put a value on uh, so that we can see what are the economic benefits for society. Here in green, so you will see where we require some inputs from users. You'll see that we've actually kept the mandatory user input to reasonably uh, constrained. And this is by design because the goal of this tool is to really help those of you who are only now starting out, who want to see the potential benefits of NBS at the pre feasibility stage without actually having to invest much effort into the on the ground measurement and the on the ground valuation. Um, of course, these. Um, for values that we have there as uh, averages, you are free to edit and you'll be able to see all of that in the tool itself. And this is more or less what I have to say. Uh, what what we, we have later now, uh, and I'll hand it over to my colleague Todd Player, he'll be able to actually show you how this works in practice on the tool website. Right, over to you, Todd. All right, thank you, Yvonne. Let me go ahead and share my screen. Okay, hopefully, uh, is, can everybody see that screen okay? Gonna assume that's a, a yes at this point. So, well, welcome everybody. Now that we've had a little bit of a background about the, the science and the methodology behind the Benefits Explorer uh, version two, uh, it's my privilege to be able to uh, bring to you uh, the, the new version and, and walk through this uh, demonstration uh, of the tool. So nice way to say I get to do the fun part of this. But before I jump into that, let me give a big thank you to uh, some of the team that uh, helped create this, other than the, the folks that are here presenting today, uh, folks at Limnotech who contributed uh, early on to this, as well as uh, Lucas Howell uh, and Dilbag Singh, who uh, joins us from Mahali, India today as the uh, developers of this tool. 
want to spend just a couple of minutes here on the uh, on the homepage and just talk a, a little bit about um, how we uh, redevelop the, the Benefits Explorer tool. Some of you may have seen the version one of the tool. I imagine most people on the call have not seen version one. But we first conducted a big overhaul of the, the user interface to be able to make it easier to use. As Yvonne said, uh, we really thought uh, long and hard about the inputs that, that we required from folks using the tool and, and really wanted to make it quick and easy to use as you explore the, the possible benefits of nature-based solutions. We'll start with uh, uh, a navigation bar here up at the top where you can uh, go directly to the tool. Uh, after this uh, presentation here today, if you forget everything that we've said and you come back, we have some written instructions as well as a video that Greg and I have recorded to, to walk you through the tool. There's a repository of, of files and links to other tools and, and websites that are useful for your exploration of, of NBS. And there's also uh, resources, which talks a little bit more about the, the methodology, contains a, a link to the, uh, the guide to download uh, that, that Greg mentioned uh, earlier. I also would be remiss if I didn't mention the Water Action Hub. You can see the blue bar up at the top with the Water Action Hub and right below that where it says, uh, Welcome Todd. Uh, I'm signed into my Water Action Hub account. This uh, Nature-Based Solutions Benefits Explorer tool is now part of our broader Water Action Hub uh, suite of uh, corporate water stewardship tools. And we really encourage folks to uh, engage with, with those uh, as well. Uh, the reason that uh, I'm signed in is because some of the functionality here does require a, a valid Water Action Hub account that is also free and easy to sign up. And the only reason that we do that is, as you'll see, uh, there's an opportunity to export PDFs and things like that, and we need to know which PDF belongs to which user. So uh, we use uh, the Water Action Hub account to uh, identify that, and again, that's free. But the core functionality of the tool is available whether or not you have a Water Action Hub uh, account, and that's definitely a, a decision that is uh, up to you. Also, a shout out to the Nature Conservancy for uh, providing some of the uh, the nice uh, screen images that you see as you come back and forth to the tool, depending on which time you visit, uh, you get a, a selection of uh, different uh, imagery there. So let's go ahead and click the go button and jump right into the tool itself. So the first uh, piece of the uh, tool is, is going to prompt you around uh, an exploration of, of activities and benefits. What do those linkages look like? So first, we're going to ask for a purpose. Uh, we can explore this from a, a perspective of if, I, if I'm interested in a particular activity, what are the benefits that might accrue from that activity? Or I can approach it from the perspective of I'm after a specific benefit. Tell me what activities will, will help me achieve that benefit. For the purposes of the demo here today, I'm going to go activities to, uh, to benefits. That's the most common way to, uh, to use the tool. And then the next is to uh, select a, a habitat for your project uh, context. We have nine of them that are in here. For the demo today, I'll stick mostly to the, to the forests. Uh, Madhu had a great example of the project in the uh, Philippines that, that you mentioned. And so we'll stick to that sort of uh, thematic area. But obviously, as you explore, part of the, the functionality of the tool encourages exploration along different uh, habitat contexts so that you can begin to understand what the different benefits are uh, in those different uh, areas. And then finally, what type of intervention do you want to explore for your chosen habitat? We have the four categories here that, that you can see. You can select any combination of those uh, four. The only requirement is that you uh, select at least one. Uh, once you have your uh, criteria established, uh, you can click the refresh button here. Uh, and you can see we can land on this dashboard of, of activities, processes, and, and benefits. For those of you that have seen version one of the tool, this probably looks pretty familiar. It's, it's nice and colorful now compared to the uh, original version as part of our user interface uh, redesign. Uh, but basically how this works is uh, over here on the left, since we wanted to explore activities to, to benefits, we go ahead and we pick a, a category. I'm just going to click on remove hard surfaces, and then you see across the right uh, the, the different processes and benefits that, that light up that are applicable to that particular uh, activity. If we want to get some information about uh, a particular benefit, uh, we can either mouse over or click on any one of these benefits over here on the right, and we get a little pop-up that gives us a, a little bit of a description of the uh, of this particular benefit. And if I want, I can uh, expand this indicators and methods uh, window here and get a little bit more information for a deeper dive on this. And the benefit forecast, which we'll get to in just a minute, uh, is down at the, the bottom. When we're done exploring this particular benefit, the little X in the upper right here will allow us to, to close out of that. And then perhaps I want to explore what is the benefit here for hydrologic surface runoff and erosion. A little bit of a smaller description for that. Also some indicators and methods. I will point out not every one of these benefits that you click on will have indicators and methods. They're included when and where they're available uh, and applicable. 
If I want to continue my exploration of activities and benefits, we have the toolbar over here on the left, this blue toolbar. I can click this filter icon up here at the top. I can go back and I can change, for example, perhaps we want to look at, at a wetland. And instead of restoration and management, I want to look at protection and creation. Refresh that, I get a different list of activities and benefits. Perhaps I want to see what planting uh, vegetation buffers is going to do. And you can see the, the groupings of, of processes and, and benefits for, for light, light up for that. If I want to explore multiple activities and understand the benefits, I can select additional activities over here and you can see a few extra processes uh, lighted up in the, in the middle when I selected those extra criteria. You can select as many as you want over here. The idea is, again, just uh, educational here, explore, uh, understand what the activities and benefits uh, linkages look like. But let's return to our, our forest uh, uh, theme here for this particular uh, demo. Let me go ahead and back to that. And we're gonna go back to our remove hard surfaces and surface water quality. I mentioned uh, the benefit forecast. We can access the benefit forecast for any one of these benefits using this little button here. There is also over in the uh, left toolbar, that same uh, graph button up near the top there, just under the filter icon. You can also access it that way. But for the purposes of this demo, I'll just click on this button right here. And then we can begin to see what uh, these graphs look like in the tool that Greg showed on, on his screen uh, just uh, a couple of minutes ago. We're looking here first at the removing hard surfaces uh, for our benefit of uh, improved or maintaining surface uh, water quality. Greg also mentioned the, the spatial and temporal scales. You can see the spatial scale here uh, with this drop down in the orange box at the right of the property, municipal and watershed level. Uh, we also have the temporal scale and the x-axis of the graph down at the bottom where you can see what the, the benefit of cool looks like early on in the project at the one to four year stage. Uh, the five to nine year stage in the middle, and then looking at the 10 year horizon and, and up, uh, beyond that. Uh, and then finally is the, uh, the Y axis, which is the benefit accrual itself, looking at a trade off level at the bottom, all the way up through a, a high benefit accrual as a, as a relative indicator across these different activities for, for this benefit. If I want to look at what uh, different spatial scales look like and switch to municipal, you see the curve flattens out a little bit and I get an understanding of what the accrual looks like at that uh, scale. And then if I go to the watershed scales and often you can see the curve uh, flattens, uh, flattens right out. Switching back to property, I also want to show you if we want to explore uh, how we can impact that surface water quality from different activities. Uh, we also provide this drop down list here for activity where I can move through different activities, perhaps interested in recharging aquifers or perhaps uh, repopulating native fauna uh, and understanding what those uh, activities uh, look like in terms of their relative uh, benefit accrual. Finally, a uh, final piece on this is this idea of uh, PDFs that I mentioned early on and, and the need for a, a water action hub. Uh, we allow you to save this, uh, these charts, these uh, graphs to uh, a PDF uh, for downloading and then perhaps circulation with your, some of your colleagues who you want to socialize uh, some of this, uh, this idea to, uh, or perhaps just for your own reference. Uh, for any of these that you want to add to a PDF, just check off the add to PDF uh, box and you can go through the uh, different ones that you have. Uh, perhaps we go back to removing hard surfaces and we wanna save that to our PDF. And you can select as many of these uh, as you want. You can use this little export button here, uh, the blue button in the lower right for uh, saving this, and it will download a, a PDF to your device, uh, which you can save or, or do what you want with. Just to reiterate, this does require you to have a valid Water Action Hub user account as uh, well as to be logged into it when you, uh, when you access the tool. So really excited about the, uh, the benefit forecast and being able to uh, explore this, uh, to explore a different um, benefit. You would come back here and pick on perhaps uh, groundwater quality or perhaps our uh, hydrologic surface uh, runoff, uh, click on uh, the, the forecast icon for that and, and begin to explore what it looks like for uh, that particular benefit uh, category. The final piece that I want to uh, to demonstrate here today, and I'm going to bring Yvonne back to the microphone here to uh, to help me a little bit with this as we go through the evaluation models, uh, is this idea of uh, uh, benefit valuation and, and a project valuation to begin to understand how uh, what is the real value of, of an NBS project that we might undertake. So over in the left uh, toolbar here, in the blue toolbar, we have a little dollar sign icon. And to access the, the valuation uh, tool and models, uh, you simply click on that. Now, this is independent of the work that you've done so far to explore activities to benefits or looking at the, the benefit forecast graph. Uh, and we first uh, require a little bit of a, a setup information to uh, about your potential project or 
uh, or maybe it's something that's a little bit further in the uh, the planning process. But the, the idea with this tool is it's a pre-feasibility uh, uh, assessment tool to help you understand, well, if I conducted a forest restoration in this particular area, here's a potential valuation for that, versus if I conducted a wetland restoration uh, in that same area, what, what do the differences look like there? So the very first prompt is around country. I'll go ahead and pick Argentina because it's just uh, near the top of the list there and has some interesting options as we go through. The reason that country matters is, is a couple of reasons. We pulled in a lot of different data sets to this, global data sets, uh, flood data, for example, around construction costs uh, in different countries around the world from the World Bank. Uh, the greenhouse gas uh, model also depends on which continent you're in around uh, what, what types of trees and uh, climate zones are available. And so we use the, that country to help uh, determine some of those things as well as others uh, uh, through, throughout the models. Second is we're back to that uh, habitat type. We've got the, the same habitat types that we've been looking at. I'm gonna stick with the, the forests theme for this. Uh, one of the things you will see is depending on which habitat type you choose, you may or may not get uh, all of the models. We do not have like agriculture, for example, as one uh, does not have a valuation model for every single category that you see there. And if you choose forest, uh, you get a forest uh, greenhouse gas sequestration model. Uh, and if you choose wetlands, you get the wetland model. So depending on which habitat type you choose here, you're gonna get a few different prompts as you go through the, uh, the different models. Uh, but for the demo today, we'll, we'll go with forests. And then finally is what is the size of the project? I'll pick a relatively modest uh, 10 hectare uh, size project. And once you're uh, done with your project setup, you can go ahead and click the, uh, the start new project button and begin moving your way through the, uh, through the models. Now at this point, I'm gonna ask Yvonne to, uh, to help walk us through a few of the details of these models as I click through. And, and so Yvonne, if you're able to come back to the uh, microphone here and talk us through the water quantity model. Sure thing, sure thing, yes. What we have here, as you see, is uh, several different challenges that your project may address. So the value of water that we return to nature will depend on who gets to use that water, yes? And in your specific situation, perhaps you're uh, addressing uh, drinking water, scarcity, perhaps it's uh, san access to sanitation, or it could just be a general reduction of water scarcity in the region. So depending on your specific situation, you would uh, remove or you would add some of the ticks here. So if we just keep all of these, and then we are assuming that our project will bring all of these benefits to our to our users in the end. And when we calculate, then the value will reflect these four components together. While if we remove some of these, obviously the value will change because we are not addressing all of these benefits at the same time. Yes. Thanks, Ivan. So the first input for uh, the water quantity is the uh, volumetric benefit. Uh, if you know your uh, uh, project is going to bring a specific benefit, you can change this number. If not, we have certain suggested uh, values that are based on our, our expert uh, input to the uh, to the tool that, that we've uh, worked on over the last uh, year. And then, of course, it is uh, dependent on the, the size of the project that I entered on the last screen. So there are certain per hectare values uh, that, that we have in, uh, for a forest model, and, and then it uh, determines what that, that volumetric uh, benefit is. If you're unsure, we suggest that you take the averages uh, and work through the tool as it still is valid because it gives you a, an understanding of the relative uh, value of, of a forest project in particular areas of the world uh, compared to, uh, say again, uh, a wetland uh, model. And as Iman mentioned, we have the different challenges here. You can check any or all of these boxes. You got to check at least one as the only requirement here. And I do want to point out two sort of like uh, little user interface things here. If there's ever any question, we've got these little eye icons that you see here around what challenges your project address. You can uh, click on those at, at various points to give you a little bit more uh, explanation of, uh, of what's going on here if, if some of these inputs aren't clear. Once you've uh, entered the information that you want, again, this is nice and easy, just click calculate. If you're not sure if this was set up with all these defaults, you just, all you have to do is click calculate. And you can see you get a, a, an interesting number there for a project uh, benefit. Again, this is specific to Argentina. If you're in a different country, you may see a, a different number here that would be uh, more or less depending on your specific uh, geography. If you're interested in the breakdown of the four checkboxes here, we have this contribution to SDG, so you can click that little uh, down arrow there and get a breakdown for with, with uh, what each of those is. And, and as you can see there, the, the biggest uh, category will be the external risk of my uh, uh, operations. When you're done with this, uh, you can click move, uh, next to move to the next one. And I'll ask Yvonne to talk uh, just a little bit about water quality for us. Sure thing, thank you. Right, what we have here, 
is a model that will estimate the value from not having to uh, treat some diffuse pollution. So nature is treating that pollution for us, so we don't have to invest in the infrastructure to do that ourselves. And this is what the value is going to reflect. You see there, there's a star where it says pollutant treated. Right now, this model only applies to nitrogen. So total nitrogen pollution being treated in a watershed. This is quite often the case because um, nitrogen is one of the more prominent uh, diffuse agricultural pollutants and most diffuse agriculture in the world will indeed come from, ag from agriculture. But uh, if in the future, what we will be doing is updating these and we'll be adding some other pollutants, especially when we build out the spatial interface to these models, and we'll be able to have a drop down and we'll be able to see what would be it would change if we were to treat not nitrogen, or, but something else. For now, the assumption is we are treating nitrogen with our with our project and we get value based on based on the value of um, how difficult it is to remove nitrogen from water. All right, thanks, Ivan. Uh, so as you can see, not a lot of input required here. It's already brought through the fact that we're, we're on a forest uh, project here from our earlier project setup screen. Also brought through our volumetric uh, water benefit from the uh, the prior screen. And as Ivan mentioned, total total nitrates is uh, what we're looking at to the pollutant here. I do also want to point out, as Ivan goes through this, if you are if you find yourself using this and you're interested in some of the details, uh, in the lower left of each of these windows, we have this model details link right here. You can click on that at any point to get uh, a little bit more information of the science and the economics behind all of these, how they were developed, uh, and different information like that. And then depending on the model, it's a more or less complex uh, explanation, as you'll see as we move to the, the next tab here, which is is our, um, excuse me, we click the calculate button here first and get our project benefit uh, for water quality, which you can see is a, a smaller number than it was on the, on the prior screen. But then let's go ahead and click next to our, our most complex model, which is the uh, greenhouse gas sequestration for, uh, for forests. And Yvonne, I'll turn it back over to you for uh, a little bit of a, a context on the greenhouse gas model. Sure, thanks, sure, thanks. Okay, so this is based on a simplified version of the methodology you see for national greenhouse gas accounting by the IPCC. Um, so in the IPCC have different levels of detailed methodologies. Here we use the least amount of detail because we're after something that is reasonably simple uh, to do in a sort of spreadsheet format that we have here. What we need to do is we need to input first where we are, the climate. Uh, the ecological zone. The ecological zone is basically the biome you're in, and that depends on climate. So if Todd goes up, up and clicks the correct climate, and if you just if you go on climate, Todd, and you just give me a drop down, yeah, well, we can click, for example, here, we're in the tropical, let's say, and then the ecological zone will depend on which climate you are in. So if you're in tropical, you should only see tropical ecological zone. So let's say we're in a, in a rainforest or in dry forest, rather, for Argentina. And then we can choose the baseline and we need to know how big is our project after. Because sometimes we start off with a project that is, let's say, 10 hectares, but then we plant some trees and then we have a bigger project now. So we have more area covered by vegetation. So you need both of these. And they could be the same because maybe we just improve the land or we change the distribution of land uses before and after. When I say distribution, this is the two drop downs there that we have baseline and project land use. So if you click on a drop down for any of those Todd, you'll be able to see that now you need to distribute those 10 hectares into different types of land uses that are applicable to this, to this uh, project. So let's say we have a natural forest and for this natural forest, we need to, to choose what trees do we have. Is it primary, is it secondary vegetation and the differences in what these are in the little eye icon that you'd be able to use. And then you need to input a percentage of the project area that is a natural forest and disturbances to do with the fact that sometimes when we do these projects, not all the, the trees make it. Some of them may die off due to disease. Some of them may not get planted um, or may not survive to adulthood. So we need to be taking into account this into account. Or occasionally we have things like fires, etc. So moving down, we would fill out all the different land uses. So uh, the percentage distributions obviously need to sum to 100 because we are uh, dividing up our baseline of 10 hectares in this case. And for these different types of land uses, you will have some different um, specific conditions that you need to you need to input. So if it's a grassland or a shrubland, for example, depends on if it's a natural grassland or a managed grassland, because then we can have some different conditions. 
Um, if it's perennial crops as well, depends on the type of cropping, depends on the type of tillage you use, on how much fertilizer you would put into the land. But we also have some other land uses that don't really sequester any carbon, like a paved surface or bare, bare rocks or annual crops in our case, because we are doing an annual assessment of the benefit. Uh, in the IPCC methodology, an annual crop will not be accounted as a carbon sink because that carbon leaves in the same year the land because the, the crop gets uh, harvested. Once we have the baseline, we do the same for the after the project land use. So this is our, our counterfactual. And once we do this, we'll be able to calculate internally what the carbon benefit is. And then we can attribute a value to that carbon. And Todd had this little box up where it says cost of carbon. There we have a few different options for the cost of carbon for you to choose. And then based on the, on the cost of carbon, we can calculate the benefit here that comes from putting the carbon out of the atmosphere and into the ground. And as you can see, it's a bit more involved to, to do in terms of user inputs, um, but still we've kept it as simple as possible while still allowing the user to actually get an answer that makes, that makes some sense. Thanks, Ivan. Right. Uh, so you, so... you also need to choose a cost of carbon. Yep, there we go. And you can also add your own if you'd like. Yes, and as Ivan said, don't uh, we'll be intimidated by this. There's a lot of inputs here, but remember, not all projects will have uh, the same types of, uh, of land use. And so it's just uh, required that you input the land use that, that's applicable for your particular project. We have all these different uh, options here as, as just different types of land use that might exist. Uh, the only requirement is that these columns here for the percentage of land use, as Yvonne mentioned, they add up to 100% before the project uh, and 100% uh, for, you know, with the project. Uh, once we've got all those entered, uh, we can go ahead and click uh, calculate and you can see we get a project benefit there around contribution to SDGs. Uh, we added uh, tons of carbon sequestered uh, if you're interested in that. Uh, and again, this is on an annual basis. And here's the model details link again in the lower left there for, for different information. And as Yvonne mentioned, there's also uh, some eye icons here that will give you a little bit more information about what it is that, that some of these uh, uh, inputs are asking for uh, that you can uh, go ahead and click on. Once you've uh, clicked uh, calculate there and you get your project benefit, go ahead and click next and we're on to biodiversity. Yvonne, back to you. Sure, sure. Right, biodiversity is a really tricky one to measure. Uh, in terms of the value. Um, there's various various academic strands. Some will tell you that the biodiversity is priceless, some uh, also the, or the value is infinite, or some other ones will say that actually a lot of these other things that we're calculating, water quantity, quality benefits, etc., are in a way underpinned by biodiversity. So if we count biodiversity separately, we'd be double counting. But what we've done here is a bit of a middle ground. We've attributed here a value only to the so-called nursery service of biodiversity. So this is the value of biodiversity um, as, as a medium that supports the proliferation of species and genes, okay? And it's a simple average the, for different land use types. So it depends only on the land use. And while we understand this is quite a simplification and this is a quite an open field of academic debate. So we've tried to give something here for users that is sensible. Uh, while also being mindful of uh, you know, this ongoing academic debate. And if you follow some of the references in the model details, maybe you can read a bit more about it. Great. Uh, thanks, Ivan. Uh, so as you can see, it's brought through our type of project as forests and uh, tropical forests from the last GHG screen we were on. So all there is to do here is click the calculate button and get your uh, biodiversity uh, valuation uh, estimation. And uh, we can move on to uh, recreation. Uh, Ivan, back to you. Sure, sure, recreation. So here we have two models. One applies to forests and we have a separate one that is uh, more for wetlands and freshwater ecosystems. So this depends on what you chose and set up for your project. Right now we have a forest and in our forest here we are using behind the scenes a value transfer function. So in the academic world, this is a statistical model that has taken a lot of different studies and aggregated up the results of those. And then when you, when you do that, you can then, based on some parameters that are happen between studies, estimate what the value is in a particular situation. In this case, we need to know if this is a natural forest or a plantation. Implication being usually that the natural forest is nicer in terms of recreation. 
Yep. So let's go with natural. Then if it's a protected area, typically intuitively that has a bigger value. And then we need to know the type of forest. So if it's a tropical forest or if it's a, if it's a temperate forest, then this will also determine what the value is. Again, intuitively, think of you know, sort of recreational opportunities you get. Uh, you know, this is people traveling to, to, to different places. For so this is what we're taking into account. And, but then this is all you need. And if you click on calculate, you'll be able to get an estimated value. Again, this is in, in a ballpark. It may not reflect the exact specific situation of where you are, but it is at least indicative of what the value may be uh, for a project of this sort. Ivan, go ahead and continue with the flood model for us. Sure, sure. I'm I'm in parallel trying to answer some questions in the Q and A. So, for, forgive me if I'm if I'm delayed a bit on those. So I'll make sure to answer all the ones that are still open. What we have left is flooding. Flooding. Uh, well, here we, it depends on the amount of flood that we are potentially attenuating. So let's say we have a flood extent of however much. Um, we did need to to know how much how what how what change for this flood. So, is it the flood depth? Is it the return period? Or is it the distribution of land uses that we have? So, implication here being, depending on the depth of the flood, the damage to different man-made assets is different. A bigger flood, flood that is more deep, will damage more buildings or more of a building. You will see there a uh, distribution of different types of man-made land uses and also natural land. So implication here is that uh, if you're damaging, for example, commercial property per hectare, that's more valuable to repair than, for example, an agricultural field. And behind the scenes, we have uh, some valuation data from, in this case, the Joint Research Center here in the European Union that has for every single country an estimate of what the potential value of damages is for different types of property. And if we know how the flooding parameters change, we can estimate the savings that we are having here because we are avoiding some damages to, to property. What we've not been able to do here for this version of the tool is actually give an average of what the benefit for flood extent attenuation may be from different nature-based projects, purely because this is something that is really, really site and context specific. So it's really, really difficult to pin down as a sort of average that makes sense in different situations. So we've left it up to the user to input something, at least to be able to play around with the numbers to see what the benefit may be. Um, in the future, hopefully we'll be able to work more on this, but this will require some more backend work in order to be able to calculate some numbers um, for the flood benefit that actually makes sense. All right, thanks, Yvonne. So we've pre-populated this with uh, some numbers from a study that was conducted in the United Kingdom in a, a town called Broomfield. Uh, if you're not sure, I mean, flood extent could be uh, hard to determine, but uh, if you're not sure about your particular situation, we'd suggest starting with, with these uh, default values. But any one of these values that you see here on the screen are, are editable and changeable to your particular uh, situation. Uh, the only requirement, uh, other than having uh, both uh, all three data points for the flood extent, depth, and return period for both before and after the project, is that the uh, land use types here around residential, commercial, industrial uh, adds up to 100%. So when you've got the uh, the values that you want in there, you just click the uh, calculate button and you can see we get a, a relatively uh, high number there for a flood uh, damage uh, estimate uh, to, uh, to contribute to our overall calculation of evaluation here. And we can click next to move to the final screen, uh, which is our uh, graph that shows us all our results as well as the table up at the top where you can see the project annual valuation in this case about 650,000 uh, US dollars for a 10 hectare uh, forest restoration project in Argentina. Uh, if you want to save this again so you can socialize it perhaps with uh, some of your uh, colleagues or something like that, uh, you must first give it uh, a name because uh, we, we need to we have a nice title uh, page for it. Uh, and we want to uh, have it uh, look nice for when you're um, sharing this with your colleagues. Uh, we also want to be able to track the, the file name and, and associate it with your, your Water Action Hub user account. Uh, and again, this, the, uh, you got to have that Water Action Hub account to do this. But use this export results to, to PDF uh, button here. It'll download the PDF to your device uh, and then you uh, can share it with others um, as appropriate. So 
one of the last pieces to this uh, before I, uh, we we move on from the, the demo of the tool here is this idea that um, you would use this uh, again and again. So we've explored an Argentina forest restoration here. And with Yvonne explaining it, it took a, us a few extra minutes to get through it. But hopefully you can see there's a, a relatively modest number of inputs. And we've put some default suggestions in there for you to, to move through and, and understand what, what some suggested values would be to get to this valuation. But this idea that we would start a new project Perhaps if we're committed to investing in Argentina, we might want to compare the forest project to a wetland project and understand where the investment could make the most sense or the most have the most return on that in investment from that perspective. On the other hand, if we have operations in multiple countries, we could compare a forest project in Argentina with perhaps a forest project somewhere in Europe or, or perhaps even uh, Asia or something like that. To do that, all you do is click the Start New Project button. Uh, we're back to the beginning. We go ahead and we pick, again, if this is Argentina, uh, and we're going to compare it to a wetland kind of project, maybe this is only a five hectare wetland, Start New Project, and we're back to the beginning here. You can see we get a different volumetric uh, benefit because we're in a different type of project. We click Calculate, and you can see we get a much bigger number as a project benefit for a wetland. And so you can begin to use the tool in this manner to explore a variety of different options, different scenarios, and uh, again, download the PDF, socialize that with, with colleagues to really understand, you know, from a pre-feasibility perspective, what a different NBS project might look like and where you should be targeting your, your investments. With that, I'll conclude the, the demo, and uh, I'm going to turn it back to, uh, to Greg and um, for uh, continuing on from here. Excellent. Thank you so much, Todd and Evan, for that really robust overview of the functionality of the um, NBS Benefits Explorer V2. It's really exciting to see where this has come from. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen one more time and just make sure that everyone uh, knows that we're not resting on our laurels here, that we really are wanting to uh, go ahead and um, update this within our stage three scope of works and where we hope to develop even more functionality over the coming years. So as part of our next steps, and one of the questions that we had in the, the, the chat function, so thank you for that upfront, was we wanted to build out more spatial context and looking at uh, adopting geospatial satellite in situ and artificial intelligence, we wanna make sure that we can make this tool as specific as possible. So if you're in Cape Town or if you're in Philadelphia, your NBS investment is going to look very different, for example. So how do we bring out that spatial context and nuance in a way that makes the, the tool a lot more geographically specific? So we're looking at developing a number of global data sets or adopting a number of global data sets, um, meshing those all together to make sure that the outputs are as locally contextual as possible. The benefits here are, are quite significant. A, a, a corporate partner or anybody else using this tool would be uh, at least better um, placed to understand the benefits in a local context. As Madhu mentioned up front, um, their investments in the Philippines versus their investments in Europe, for example, are going to generate very different outputs across the different thematic areas and the benefit categories. So how do we build out that context in, in a way that's meaningful to those that are using this tool uh, in a global context? We'd like to show where NBS investments are going to be most catalytic and have the greatest impact. So uh, what, what this looks like across different scales, and I'll show you those in the upcoming slides. Um, ultimately, we're wanting to show what the potential is through collective action initiatives as well. So if there are several organizations operating in a certain basin, they want to see some replenishments and volumetric benefits, what does an investment within that basin look like? And where's the most strategic location for that investment? As mentioned, Several global data sets will be integrated as much as possible and um, to get the, the, the biggest bang for buck across our different thematic areas, our benefit categories. So what this will look like is depending whether you're in Canada, Japan, South Africa, Brazil, for example, or, or, or um, Colombia, um, Ecuador, it really does um, showcase the diversity of benefits that would accrue. Again, those forecasts and valuation estimates would be very relevant to the local context in which the NBS tool is being explored across. So we're wanting this to be as contextual as possible. And so not as much as a general tool it is now saying, if you're in a forest habitat, this is what you will get. And um, so we can at least break that down as much as possible by, by geography and location. Just as a, a general overview of what this would look like, we'd take different data sets, different vectors and raster files, we'd mesh all those together, 
and the output would be something that you would see on the right hand side of your screen there, where you could see where the probability of investment would be the most impactful or most catalytic. We could potentially have um, something around cost implication as well, where the cost would be most beneficial or most um, cost effective, for example. So we could have different outputs, uh, different levels or, or, or scales of um, context or, or geographic uh, nuance built in here. Potentially, as I've mentioned, through a collective action initiative uh, or, or other focus area entry point, you could then also see where your investment would be most strategic or catalytic within a larger or, small, or smaller spatial scale. We'd be able to provide different forecasts, different valuation estimates, um, and different benefit identification as well, based on where, where you could potentially uh, influence or invest in a nature-based solutions project um, within a certain geography as well. So a number of very cool geospatial uh, considerations are being um, hopefully built into version three of this tool over the, over the next year or two. So the last slide from my side is just a call to action. How can you engage with this project most effectively? And the first is obviously to explore the new version of the Benefits Explorer tool. Um, please share your stories of how you're using the tool. If you are taking the tool and then investing in a, in a project, we'd love to hear that on how our tool is helping scale up and mainstream NBS investment globally. Um, please feel free to reach out to anyone in the project team and just let us know where you're using the tool, how you're using the tool, what you're looking at investing in. Is it a forest or wetland, agricultural project, for example? We'd love you to hear your stories. Even if it's a one-line email, it really does help us go and, and track the impact over space and over time. The next is to become a project partner in stage three. Um, today marks the culmination of stage two. We now start moving into stage three from February. Um, and there, there are multiple opportunities for you to get um, involved and engage in stage three. The first is to provide data. If you are if you are the holder, you know of global data sets that could inform our geospatial elements, please let us know. We've already started building out this repository of global data sets and we've amassed around 40 or 50. Some are going to be more relevant than others, but if you are in the data sciences or if you know of data or if you use data sources, please feel free to share those with us. We're always looking for uh, digital tool development partners. Uh, we have a number within our sites. We've already started some negotiations and discussions with these tool development organizations, but we'd welcome any support from a tool development perspective. And then obviously these kinds of tools and uh, guidance documents don't um, come cheap. So if there is any financial sponsorship that you feel that you would be able to pass our way, we'd be more than willing to, um, to look into possible uh, financial collaborations that way. So again, reach out across any opportunity to become a project partner. And the third, uh, one of the questions as well was how we validate some of this. And we're always looking for case studies to validate. We'd love to ground truth and validate the outputs of our tool to make sure that what we're developing is robust and rigorous, that we're not just sucking things out of thin air, but really producing something that is um, as aligned as possible with real world case studies. And we're very fortunate to have several corporate partners that are uh, willing to share their existing NBS studies. Um, and, and we welcome anyone else to, to come to the party as well so that we can validate what we're suggesting as outputs is aligning very closely with real world opportunities as well. So just to thank everybody for attending this meeting, to the speakers for your time and your effort in this uh, endeavor, um, to the developers, Todd, you've mentioned up front, a number of other folk that were critical to the success of this tool. Just thank you so much for, for getting us over the line. And I'm super, super thrilled with, with the outputs to date. So again, just a reminder that we have two project pages. One is the cowaterman.org forward slash NBS. All of our project outputs are, are housed there. The copy of this uh, webinar will also be, be housed there. So, so please feel free to visit that site at any opportunity. And then again, explore the tool, uh, play with the tool. Let us know how the tool is informing your NBS investments uh, globally. And then if you have any questions as project lead, I'm happy to field those. And if I can't answer them, I'll direct them to the relevant party. But please feel free to reach out at Greg Brill or gbrill at packinst.org. Um, again, thank you so much to the speakers, but most of all to my project partners, the Sea Water Mandate, Pacific Institute, the Nature Conservancy, Limnatec, Denkstadt, and Coca-Cola. Uh, without you all, this project would never have been the success that it is. So thank you, everybody, for joining. And I wish you well on your NBS journey going forward. Thank you so much. Thank you, Greg.